Well, good morning, Stafford Crossing. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. We're so glad that we could gather together and to worship our God. In the Psalms, it says that God is the strength, my strength and my portion forever. And so we're going to stand together and we're going to sing a song that just talks about the fact that every beat of our heart belongs to that God who is our strength and portion forever. Stand with us and sing, please. <laughs> You make the darkness run and hide. You bring the broken back to life. Only you can, only you can. You set me free from every chain. You fill my heart with songs of praise. Only you can, only you can. Jesus, you're the only reason that I'm even breathing. I am wide awake. My heart beats. Only for your glory, my hands reach up for you to hold me. My soul sings, Father, you are holy. My feet dance to your rhythm, to your rhythm. Every beat is calling, every beat is calling out. the glory of your throne to bring this runaway back home only you can only you can you give me love you give me life you keep me dancing through the night only you can only you can my heart beats only for your glory my hands reach up for you to hold me. my soul sings Father, you are holy. My feet dance to rhythm, to rhythm. Every beat is calling. Every beat is calling out your name. Calling you, Lord. Every beat is calling. Every beat is calling out your name. Jesus, you're the only reason that I'm even breathing. I am wide awake. You move me, your freedom is consuming. I feel it rushing through me. I'll never be the same. My heart beats only for your glory. My hands reach up for you. To hold me, my soul sings. Father, you are holy. My feet dance to your rhythm, to your rhythm. Every beat is calling, every beat is calling out your name. Every beat is calling, every beat is calling out your name. Every beat is calling. Every beat is calling out your name. Amen. Before you have a seat, would you turn around and say good morning to someone close by? Good morning. Welcome to Stafford Crossing. We are so glad you are here, whether you've joined us on campus or you have joined us online. We are here to worship our God and so thankful you've joined us. If you're a guest with us, we'd love to know you're here. You can do that from the uh, connection section in your sermon notes or from the link in your digital bulletin. Just fill that out. Let us know how we can best serve you. Lots of other information in the digital bulletin you will want to be aware of. Um, you can submit a prayer request. You can give online, and there's information about upcoming events. A couple we're really excited about are mission trips happening this summer. It is so nice to be able to be back on the ground with some of our ministry partners. The end of June, 
We have a team heading to Uganda where they will work with progressive missions, the children in the school, also a couple medical clinics that are there. And then the 1st of July, we are headed back to Jamaica where we'll work with Upper Room Community Church as they provide medical care to their community, the community of Grants Penn, Jamaica. Great opportunity for you to be the hands and feet of Jesus, get right on the ground, and while providing physical med medical care to the communities, also just investing for eternity. So be sure and check out that information, see where you can plug in this summer. And now we're going to continue to worship, so please come to your feet and join us. Sing with me. There's a power that's made perfect in my weakness. Fills me up with the strength that is fearless. I find hope within your everlasting promise. It fans my faith into flame. I'm living with a fire burning inside of me. I'm living for the Savior, Jesus, eternally. With all that I am, Lord, I give you my heart so that the flame shine brighter. Let your praise sing louder. Turn morning into dancing When I praise I can feel the darkness trembling All my fear is swept away by perfect love You fan my faith into flame I'm living with the fire Burning inside of me I'm living for the Savior, Jesus, eternally. With all that I am, Lord, I give you my heart. So let the flame shine brighter, let your praise sing louder. I'm living with the fire burning inside of me. I'm living for the Savior, Jesus, eternally. With all that I am, Lord, I give you my heart. So let the flame shine brighter. Let your praise sing louder. No darkness can stand against our God. Sing with us. No darkness can stand against this brighter glory. His promise is sure. Jesus decides my story. No darkness can stand against this brighter glory. His promise is sure jesus decides my story no darkness can stand against this brighter glory his promise is sure jesus decides my story Savior, Jesus, eternally. With all that I am, Lord, I give you my heart. So let the flame shine brighter. Let your praise sing louder. I'm living with the fire burning inside of me. I'm living for the Savior. Eternally, with all that I am, Lord, I give you my heart. So let the flame shine brighter. Let your praise sing louder. 
Decides my story. No darkness can stand against this brighter glory. His promise is sure. Jesus decides my story. I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful that Jesus decides my story. Let's continue to worship. You make it easy to love you You are good and you are kind You bring joy into my life You make it easy to trust you You have never left my side You've been faithful every time upon that cross you redeemed what I had lost now my whole world's revolving around you you're the center of my life you're the treasure you're the bride to fear for you are by my side I'll follow you anywhere follow you
nothing to fear for you are by my side I'll follow you anywhere follow you anywhere oh I'll follow you anywhere oh I'll follow you anywhere amen and amen will you please have a seat So good morning, Stafford Crossing. It's great having those of you here in our worship center. And if you have us on a screen somewhere, thank you for inviting us in. You know, one of the things that is really easy for us to understand are a lot of different metaphors that are actually discussed and talked about in the Bible. There are some that are just like incredible. They're eye-popping, they're mind-grabbing, they're spirit-stirring, and they're easy for us to understand and relate to in 2023. Let me just share some as an example. In Isaiah chapter 64, Scripture says, We are the clay, you are the potter, and all of us are the work of your hand. I've seen on social media this year, people in our church taking a pottery class, right? And they're in class, and then you see the finished product a few weeks later, and it's like, that happens these days, right? We can relate to that. And in this specific metaphor, God is compared to the potter who is making and molding and shaping us, his disciples, the clay. And so we can connect to that. Wow, just as the shaping of clay happens, we see the shaping that happens in our lives that is done by the person of Jesus. Over in John chapter 6, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Bread of life. Just this year, I have seen people practicing with their bread machines they got at Christmas. Nobody's brought me any to try it. That's another story. I'm not a keto guy. I bring it. I'm I'm good with bread. Uh, But, you know, this bread of life, we understand the metaphor that God is using here. And just like we need physical bread to sustain us physically... God says, hey, you're going to need spiritual bread. I am the bread of life. I will nurture you in a spiritual sense. Then in John chapter 15, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Some of us enjoy gardening. Some of us enjoy seeing things grow so that we can eat them. Yesterday was a glorious day. I got to mow my grass. It was great, you know. I never have mowed my grass in the first week of March, you know. It's like, this is amazing. I'm okay. I'm feel, I really feel good. You know, that's normal for me. Uh, you're like, really? Yeah, yeah. That's just something I enjoy doing. But we understand that gardening aspect, right? It's a little bit early for us to be planting stuff, but soon things will be growing and we'll be harvesting. And we understand and know, wow, if there's going to be a harvest, that branch must be connected to the vine. And in the spiritual sense here, Jesus is saying, listen, if you're going to produce anything spiritual in your life, you must be connected to me. I am the vine. You are the branch. We understand that metaphor. Probably the most familiar, common metaphor that's used in the Bible is one of sheep and a shepherd. A sheep and a shepherd. But the day and age in which we live is not agrarian. It's not an agricultural society, you know. You're not going to leave here driving home and stop for sheep to cross the road. If you're in other parts of the world, that would be common. It would happen. In a couple of weeks, um, there'll be 31 of us in Israel. It will happen. It's amazing. It's cool. It doesn't happen here. Not in our streets. Not in our town. And so it's easy to become a little distant and disassociated with that idea of sheep and shepherds. 
but it is one of the most common metaphors. And since David is the subject of our series, I think it's appropriate that we look at some of the most famous words that he penned in Psalm 23. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And again, in this metaphor, one of the most popular uh, passages in the Bible, there's people who are not even religious or spiritual who've heard the 23rd Psalm. It's, it's a common passage of Scripture. And God is compared to a shepherd. We are compared to sheep. We need Him to look after us. We need Him to actually care for us. Now, now even if you did not grow up in a farming community or on a farm or in a rural setting, I think with a little bit of help, we can grasp exactly what this passage is referring to and the picture that this passage is painting for us as disciples of Jesus today. The Bible refers to God's people, to those who have trusted and followed Jesus as sheep, some 220 times. It's not just in passing that we are referred to as sheep. It is a common repetitive theme in Scripture. And there's times that that sort of disappoints me and it sort of bothers me. It's like, how couldn't we be, why couldn't we be referred to as something like great and grand and majestic? I don't know what that would be if it is, you know, a lion or a triumphal horse. I don't know what it would be, but we are sheep. Sheep. I think the reason is God knew a little bit about our nature. He knew just a little bit about our character and about our tendencies. And that is why we were referred to as sheep. Well, this morning we are in part three of our series on the life of David. And I think it's appropriate that we have talked a little bit about this idea of sheep and shepherds. And we're going to go further there today. Because what I want us to understand and really grasp today is that as followers of Jesus, we are called to shepherd our crowd. We are called to shepherd the people that God has sovereignly placed in our lives. See, there's not a single person, there's not a single relationship that you have or I have that is by accident. God has aligned us and put us in relationship with people for His good, for their good, for His glory. It is significant and important that we are intersecting their lives for gospel good. We talk a lot around Stafford Crossing in our church that we want to be a renovator. One who relentlessly participates in God's transformative work for all. We get to do that as we shepherd people, that we want to be an ally, one who intentionally builds relationship for gospel impact. We want to be that kind of shepherd. We talk about being a guide, one who faithfully prepares to help others deepen their relationship with God. We want to shepherd people that way. We talk a lot about being an investor, one who willingly gives of themselves for a direct return in eternity. You and I, as shepherds of others, get to see God work in those various ways in and through our lives. But as we think about David, as we think about him being a shepherd, again, that is not a metaphor that really resonates unless you've been in an agriculture, country kind of setting. So I want to take a few moments and just talk about, to start, about the nature of sheep. And so whether you have your sermon notes you received on the way in or whether you're watching, maybe you even here, you have it on your app, uh, through our, uh, you get it through our app or our website, follow along and capture these thoughts. First thing I want us to understand and note about sheep is they're relatively unintelligent animals. Um, children, you can talk to your parents later, excuse me for using this word, they're just stupid. They're not intelligent, they're not smart, they don't know that much. They're unaware of their surroundings. They will ignorantly wander around in danger. And before you know it, they're going around looking for green pastures. There's not any. And they will find themselves in um, rock uh, mountainous areas that are dangerous. They will find themselves in dangerous cliffs. It is amazing where they will find themselves. So we must be very careful to note that they are unintelligent. Therefore, sheep need protection. Sheep are helpless against predators. Oftentimes in Israel, at the end of a day, uh, a shepherd will take his flock and head to a cave-like structure in the side of a hill or a mountainous area. And they will enter into that in what is called into a sheepfold. They'll go into a sheepfold. And that is where they will spend the night. And they will stay there. And for that area, for that cave to be safe, the shepherd will lie down at the entrance. There's only one entrance to this cave. 
And as he lays down on this at this entrance, sheep can't exit, but neither can predators enter. Lays there for protection. Sheep only respond to their shepherd's voice. As I said, these sheep, they will go into a sheepfold at night. And typically, there they can be multiple flocks in this area. And then the very next morning, when it's time to go out and graze, shepherds will start making sounds. Sometimes it's a song. Sometimes it's an utterance that they will use. But only their sheep will actually get up and leave with them. I wish I had time today to show a couple of videos of that. You can YouTube those. It's amazing. Strangers come up and try to beg the sheep to come up to a fence, and they just stay out in there and I'm not paying you any attention. But all of a sudden, the shepherd, his voice, man, they come running. Sheep only listen to the voice of their shepherd. Sheep, like us, need plenty of food. Can I get an amen to that one? Yeah, we, uh, they like plenty of food. And so that it's the shepherd's job to make certain that they lie down in green pastures. They have plenty to eat. If there's not plenty to eat, they will end up starving. They will end up wandering away, wandering off, looking for more. It's also interesting to note about food. When it comes to sheep, is they um, have to process, obviously, the food that they have eaten. And once they've eaten... If they do not lie down, they can't digest that food. And that's why the good shepherd will make them lie down in green pastures so they can actually process, digest what they've already eaten. But they have to have plenty of food, and then they need to digest that food. And so the shepherd sometimes must make them to lie down for their own good, even though they don't think it's time. He said, no, it's time to lie down. Sheep need plenty of water. They require a lot of water, but they will not drink moving water. They will only drink from water that is not running out of fear. So it's got to be still. It's got to be slow. It can't be moving. And so a shepherd must find still water for the sheep so that they will actually drink and stay hydrated. The last thing I want us to note about sheep is sheep cannot get up if they are cast down. If you've read the Bible any at all, you've, you've probably seen this phrase. What does it mean to be cast down? in your spirit. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? It, it's used in Scripture. And under certain circumstances, there would be a time when a sheep would turn over on its back, but not be able to turn back over. And that can be fatal. Because there's a lot of bodily functions that happen in a sheep by the good old work of gravity. Right? Gravity helps them. Gravity allows the blood to drain out of their legs. It allows the stomach to digest their food. Um, if they lay in that condition, it can block their breathing. And so again, that is what the Bible refers to as being cast down. It's not some position you want to be in very long. Now folks, that is a quick run through, and it's, there's more aspects and qualities of sheep. But those are important for us in terms of where we're going today. Because what I want to do now is read one of David's most famous psalms the 23rd Psalm. And in just knowing these few facts about sheep and about the environment and how this happens, as we read through the 23rd Psalm, I believe for some of us, there will be a light bulb to go on. It's like, oh, that's what that phrase means. Wow, I never knew that. Let's read this together with that kind of awareness and things that we just learned. David starts out, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. David is referring to himself as a sheep. He's referring to God as the good shepherd of his life. He makes me lie down um, um, in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. And suddenly after what we just learned, we understand, wow, that sheep need to have green pastures to graze. But they also have to be able to lie down there to digest the food that they've eaten. And they must have water that is still not moving quiet waters where they can have be renourished and hydrated he restores my soul he guides me in paths for righteousness of righteousness for his name's sake and even though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear no evil for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me you can think about that shepherd lying at the entrance to this sheepfold and there's a rod and there's a staff and not only is the shepherd there to provide protection against predators entering, he also has his tools for the job. 
And he has a tool there. They keep the predators from entering and also for this sh- for, they keep the sheep from going out. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Sheep need a shepherd. They need a good shepherd who will just naturally care for the flock. Now, obviously, David was a shepherd boy who understood this. David was a shepherd boy before what we saw last week, where he went out and defeats Goliath. And in that encounter, if you recall, if you were here, if not, you can go back and watch. He, he, he tells the king, listen, I've been out shepherding. I've killed a bear. I've killed a lion. I've protected some sheep. I've got this giant. Right? He refers back to his days of being this shepherd boy. Sheep and shepherds. So we know a little bit about the nature of sheep. Let's learn a little bit about the roles a shepherd plays in light of what we know about sheep now. First, a shepherd has to be focused on his flock. A shepherd can't be out on the mountainside checking out TikTok videos, tweeting, scrolling through Facebook, right? A shepherd has to be what? He's got to be dialed in. He has to be focused. Otherwise, these sheep will go rogue. Before you know it, these sheep will just wander off aimlessly. These sheep will go nibble, 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 ah, and they'll die. You have to be very careful. You got to be attentive. You got to be focused on these dumb sheep. In Ezekiel chapter 34, there is a powerful ref- a reference to what to that role of focusing on us that God plays. Listen to these words. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in all the settlements of the land. I will tend them in a good pasture, and the, and the, mountains high, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the sovereign Lord. You hear the focus that God has for us, his sheep? He's going to pasture us. He's going to feed us. He's going to have us lay down and rest when it's time. He's going to care for us and and, and bring us in and rescue us from harm. Again, a shepherd must focus on his sheep. Not only does a shepherd have to focus, but a shepherd must sacrifice for the flock. He's got to sacrifice. You know, in the Middle East, I mean, it's frequently hot. It's barren. It's dry. Um, I, I can think about on occasions when I've been there, the Sahara Desert from Africa starts blowing sand up. I mean, you're hundreds of miles away, man, and you're getting pelted with sand like you're getting sandblasted. And a shepherd has to endure that environment. They're in the elements. It's hot. It's, it's, it's windy. And a shepherd also must face danger. If there's a predator, it's like, hey, I've got to be the protector. I've got to be the shield. I've got to make sure that these sheep are secure and safe. He gives his life for the sheep. The Gospel of John writes about this. These are the words of Jesus that he captures. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But again, the true Shepherd will sacrifice. The true shepherd will leave everything on the line to make certain that those sheep are protected and safe. A true shepherd will sacrifice for the sheep. Good shepherds also feed the flock. As we saw, sheep have to be fed. They have to be watered. They have to be nurtured. Otherwise, they won't prosper. They won't multiply. Here's what Psalm 95, 7 says, For he is our God... And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. 
Again, when you think about the people of his pasture, hopefully that makes more sense. It resonates with our spirit more now, knowing how sheep function, that they have to have green pastures, yes, for eating, but also for lying down, for rest. He is the people of his pasture. We are the people of his pasture. So a good shepherd will feed the flock. He'll lead them to a place to eat in, true safe, in a truly safe fashion. Shepherds also protect the flock. Predators love to attack sheep. Sheep have no natural defense systems. We can think about other animals, critters that have defense systems. You know, there's scales on fish. You can think about some animals have these huge goring horns. Um, Sheep don't have any of these kind of protective devices. And as I said earlier, they're not that smart. And so they don't have that instinctual knowledge to know when a predator is nearing. That's why they need a good shepherd. Sheep are not that fast. They can't outrun a lot of predators that would be coming. So again, there has to be that protection. Because quite often there would be a predator that will come and like run right into the middle of a herd and they scatter. It's like 99 goes this way and one goes that way. And you and I know exactly what we call that one, right? It's called dinner. That's the one that's going to be attacked. That's the one that's going to be devoured. And so that good shepherd keeps the flock together because in that there is safety, in that there is protection. In 2 Chronicles chapter 18 we read, Then Micaiah answered, I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, These people have no master. Let each one go home in peace. Again, when sheep are scattered... Some are going to be devoured. And so, when we think about the nature of sheep, when we think some about the roles of shepherds, how does this mesh, how does this go together with our spiritual lives? Because it's not in Scripture just to tell us more about sheep or more about shepherds. At the end of the day, all God's Word is for correction, for reproof, for training in righteousness. So how does God take this and intend it Intended um, for it to grow us, mature us, transform us. Well, Scripture is clear time and time again that you and I, as His disciples, are like sheep. We're like sheep who are gone astray. This is what the prophet Isaiah says. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And that points to our reality. In reality, we are more like sheep than we want to admit. Let me just repeat that in case you're not on. We, as disciples, are more like sheep than we want to admit. And we can go back and look at some of those recurring traits, character, uh, the traits in the nature of sheep and go, oh yeah, that can be me at times. Oh, I can look back in my life, that's happened. I wish I wasn't like this as much as I am. We are more like sheep than we would like to admit. And the prophet He talks about our need for the atoning work of Jesus. Because like sheep, we can be headstrong, we can be stubborn, we can be stupid, we can fill in the blank. And we need a Savior. Each of us has turned away from God and pursued our own way. And you think back just to January and February, that's why we started off this year with that series, Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. We said, what would it look like if we as sheep stopped and paused and asked some great questions and then honestly answered those questions? And then what if we honestly acted on that honest answer? Could we live a life that was more God-honoring? Could we live a life that was actually filled with fewer regrets. Yeah, we understand that we are more like sheep than we want to admit. But in those moments, the second part of that verse paints an incredibly powerful picture of God's love for His sheep. Let's read it in its its full context. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And now let's add this. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, the last part of this verse 
points us to what Jesus has done for us. It points us to Jesus' response. And we understand that we have a sin problem, we have a sin condition. And this passage shows us that he was wounded for our transgressions. That he took upon, his, his son took upon himself our iniquity, all of the wrongs that we have done. The things that Daryl should have been punished for. The things that Daryl should have been held accountable for. Jesus on the cross said, I will take that. I will take that for my son. That is something that theologians call the substitutionary atonement of Jesus. That Jesus was my substitute. And if you've placed your faith and trust in him, he was your substitute. On the cross, he stood in your place. On the cross, he was your sub. He says, I'll take that. I'll go in for you. Put me in, coach. Put me in, Father. And on the cross, he was our substitute. He took our sin. He paid the price, the debt that we owed on the cross. In the Gospel of John, um, there are eight I am statements. There's so many different ways to study the Bible, right? We can go verse by verse. Well, we spent a year and a half in Acts that way. Right now we're studying the character of David. We see there's a shepherd boy. and We're talking about sheep and shepherds. But another way to study the Bible is different themes. And in the book of John, there are eight I am statements. And these I am statements refer, is how Jesus refers to himself. He says, I am, and in eight different ways, eight different metaphors he uses. Two of those eight, relate directly to a sheep and a shepherd. And I want us to look at those this morning. The first one is in John chapter 10. Jesus says, therefore Jesus says it said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. You got that? We talked about a gate, how a shepherd would lie down, right? I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And in that passage, we see the first of Jesus' response to us, that Jesus becomes the gate for our safety and our security. He becomes the gate for our safety and security. We talked about how at the entrance of this cave that a shepherd would 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 lay down. And as the shepherd would lay down, the sheep could not go out, but neither could the predator enter. Jesus says, I'm that for you. To all the things that come at you in life, I will protect you. I am your source of security. I love the way theologian A.W. Tozer says it. He says, the only safe place for sheep is by the side of the shepherd. Because the devil does not fear sheep, he just fears the shepherd. So my friends, today we can celebrate that Jesus, the good shepherd, is our source of safety and he's our source of security. Now the second I am statement that John writes about, and these are the words of Jesus, starts in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. Sounds a little bit like Ezekiel, all right? So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks and the flock scatters it. Well, the man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. And this shows a beautiful imagery of how Jesus lays down his life for his sheep. He dies for his sheep. He's willing to go to great lengths to provide protection and security and safety. I mean, just think about the shepherd-like care that Jesus gives his sheep. I don't know about you, but I can look back into my life, different seasons, different times, different moments. And man, I am just moved. I am just touched. Looking back to, well, well, God, you showed up there. Looking back, I see that in the moment I thought I was alone. But no, no, you were there. You entered my space. You were there with me, for me, by me. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. In those moments where God shows up, he literally lays down his life. And as we talk about this imagery of a shepherd laying down at the entrance of a cave, of a sheepfold, the culture that Jesus was speaking, they knew exactly what he was talking about. We have to know a little bit more to understand where he's going. 
but to see, wow, he would lay down. He would give, the shepherd would give his life for the sheep. The predator would have to kill him to get to the sheep. Jesus says, tells Satan, no, no, you have no right. You have no authority here. The good shepherd gives his life. So yeah, we have seen, learned some things about sheep. We've learned some about the role of a shepherd. We understand that we, yeah, we're more like sheep than we like to admit. And we see our, our, our good shepherd's response. Jesus comes and provides security. He provides safety. And Jesus comes along and he lays down his life for us. But as I said earlier, the, the teachings in Scripture, it's not just information. It's designed to be transformation. What does God want to do in my life, in your life, in light of what we've learned? And as I said earlier, what I really want to think about is the fact that Jesus calls his disciples, calls me and he calls you, to be a shepherd of our flock. To be a shepherd of those relationships that he's entrusted into our care. And so have you ever thought about yourself being a shepherd? Not in the sense of having a staff and going out into the field, but I'm talking about shepherding the relationships that God has sovereignly placed in your life. You can think about family. You can think about work. You can think about somebody you commute with. You can think about, you know, a parent on your kid's soccer team, whatever. But think about the multitude of relationships that are in your life. They're, ne they're not there by accident or happenstance or just to get something done or accomplished. God wants to use that to shepherd them spiritually. So let me walk through what that might look like. Last week, Mark did a great job unpacking catalyst groups where two or three people or maybe two couples get together and they study God's Word using a SOAP acronym. If you weren't here, if that's new, be sure and check out that message on our app or our website. There's also a QR code that talks about those catalyst groups in detail where you can check that out from your sermon resource page. Another ministry inside our walls are engage groups. These are small groups of people that get together to connect and also to engage God work, God's Word. And there's several tiers to how that can happen. There's several different ways an engage group can happen. Some of our engage groups are pure Bible study groups. There'll be 6, 8, 10, 15 people get together. They study God's Word. They do life together. Amazing. Great. There are other engage groups that are maybe more activity-focused. Um, maybe they are a running group, or maybe they enjoy bird watching, but then they bring in discipleship elements, Bible study elements, and prayer for one another. Some are in affinity groups, a certain lifestyle, uh, stage of life. Maybe it's a certain things they like to do together, and they, again, will bring in spiritual growth components. Some of those are rally around some of our mission partners. Hey, I'm going to go serve at Beauty for Ashes and love on those single moms who are doing their recovery work and help with their kids while they're doing their work. And so a group would meet there and serve those ladies and those children, and then they would bring in discipleship opportunities for themselves. So many different ways that engage groups happen. Again, there's a QR code to learn more about an environment to where you can be shepherded. But sometimes we can think about other opportunities of shepherding, like shepherding our children, shepherding our teens. I'm so thankful that today we were able to relaunch our age-graded children's ministry both hours. So kids are able to have that environment while we're in here. Our um, infants all the way through fifth graders are in their specific age-graded rooms where Lisa and her team provides them with great biblical content and then resources parents to continue that conversation at home. Maybe you as a parent go like, wow, I want to get my, my child in that environment. That's awesome. That's good. There's capacity here. Maybe your teenagers. Um, tonight is our Fusion Student Ministry, and David Jackson and his team do a great job creating the environment for students and teens to learn and to be shepherded. And so again... I would encourage you if you have a teen and they're not there to look at that, to have, let that be a part of your shepherding. But maybe you're here and you're like, I would like to do some shepherding in those areas, like in the class and serve. There's a QR code also in the sermon resource of how you can say, hey, I'd like to help. How could I be a part of helping people be shepherded to be more like Jesus? There's also opportunities for parents on our at-home wall. Right on the other side of this wall at the back of the worship center are all kinds of resources to have spiritual conversations. You can also access those through our app or through our website. 
But again, parents are the primary disciples of their children, and that's just a way where we can partner with you to help in that journey. So be sure and check those out. When it comes to parenting uh, and discipling children, I was listening to a podcast last week, and I just want to put out three little words that might help some of you parents or some of you care providers, nurturers. I talked about the role of adults in the lives of children these days, and I said, wow, man, that was good. I'm going to use that, and I didn't know it was going to be this soon. But this, um, this podcaster had three words for parents. Number one is parents have to be informed. So parents, in this day and age, it is hard to know everything that's going on. Just about every week, I learn a word or a phrase or something I didn't know. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. That's new. It didn't exist before. And so parents, you have work to do to be informed about what's happening in the school, in their friendships, in the world, in the media. How much are they on the internet? What are their, what are their favorite apps? How long are they on each day? I mean, you must be informed. Second thing, you must be involved. And that is hard in our culture because of commutes and times. And even though people are back to work more now, everybody's not teleworking. It's like, I'm busy. And so you leave at 4 or 5 in the morning. You're home at 6 or 7 at night. And being involved is more than just saying, hey, here's the latest tech. You know, you can have this new gear. Good luck. Hey, um, it's more than being their free Uber driver. You know, it's, it's more than that. But to where you are informed and involved in their life. You know what's happening. You know what's taking place. And the third word, students aren't going to like, children aren't going to like, but it's best. Parents, you are in charge. You're in charge. By God's design, you are in charge. And students are like, no, I'm the boss of me. No, you're not. You want to be. One day you will be, but right now you're not. God has placed your mom, your dad, your guardian in your life for such a time as this, to nurture you, to guide you, They have more wisdom. They have more knowledge. They have more life experience. And so you must grow in your maturity to realize, wow, God has them there for a purpose. God has them there to nurture me, to disciple me, to shepherd me. And trust God that it's for your best interest. A lot is taking place in our culture. And I want to encourage us. We have the opportunity to be a shepherd. To be a shepherd. So the question... The last thing on your fill-in, who is it? Who in your life has God positioned for you to be a shepherd? When are you going to start? How are you going to do it? Would you pray about that this week? That is our action item, that God has called us to be a shepherd of his people. You know, there's not a more beautiful imagery of being a shepherd than baptism. Baptism. And I cannot think of a more fitting way to end our service than to see and celebrate where people realize that, yes, Jesus did lay down his life for me. And they surrender to Jesus' lordship of their life through the waters of baptism. This is a symbolism of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. And it shows that as a follower, I'm dying to an old way of life and I'm being raised to newness of life. And very since the, since the Great Commission in the end of Matthew, we've been instructed as followers that this is how we identify as a follower of Jesus So let's celebrate that today. That's right. We have uh, five people being baptized today, and they're making that public statement that I have put my trust in Jesus. I've made him my shepherd, and I'm responding to his voice, right? And and that that command to be baptized. And so we want to celebrate that. We want to witness that together today. And uh, when I say celebrate, I I don't mean like a, a, a nice, polite, like, yeah, that was good. You know, but uh, this, this should be a loud, this should be a fun celebration as we honor them, as we honor God most of all, and, uh, and celebrate this. So l- just make it fun and loud. All right, and we are going to start today with Patty. Patty McConnell, come on up. And we're going to, as the people are coming up, our friends here are going to read their testimony. So it's their words, their story of God's work in their life uh, that will be read for them. Everything else was hazy. I proceeded through my life without seeking God in my life at all. I had many struggles, made some poor decisions, and always felt like I was missing something in my life, but I didn't know what. Fast forward to May of 2022. I was having a lot of unwanted, unwarranted issues at work, so I started praying, and I even asked my friends to pray for me too. One Saturday, I was beside myself with nowhere to go. 
Feeling so lost and afraid, I decided to go to church the next day. I went to Stafford Crossing because it was so close to my home and a dear friend had gone there and said it was nice. Because I was new, they met me at the door, showed me in, and gave me gifts. I walked in, sat alone, and cried because the music touched my soul and the sermon felt like it was written just for me. I left feeling so calm and still. The following week, I lost my job. Again, I was devastated, and all I could think of was to go back to church. I went back that Sunday, sat alone, put in a prayer request, received a call that week, and I was even asked if I was interested in going to a luncheon at Pastor Darrell's house. I went to the luncheon, and while there, I met so many beautiful Christian women that were so kind to me. There were three that stood out the most to me, Pat Newton, Denise, and Mayola. After that, I would sit with them at church and grew to love the church and my amazing new friends I had. Work struggles continued and I lost my job again. Instead of going straight home, mad and upset, I stopped at the church and I was met by Kathy who listened and prayed with me. On Monday, I was called back to the job, the one that just let me go, and was asked if I would be interested in another job with another department. I accepted and started that following day. That was all God. From that moment on, I felt God's presence everywhere and in every situation that came up. That was when I accepted Jesus as my savior. I still struggle with things, but I know in my heart that I'm never alone and that God will always be at my side. I'm being baptized today to declare my trust in Jesus and sharing my story in hopes that someone going through hard times can know that putting your faith in God, although times may still be hard, it's so much easier knowing that God is with you always. Amen. 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 Patty, there's, uh, there's, there's so much to love about your story, how you encountered God and Jesus here, how you made uh, community and friends like Pat here. And uh, so together, Pat and I, it's a privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our next baptism is Ted Allen. I discovered God later in my life as an adult. Growing up, I knew of God, but didn't fully understand the meaning of God and Jesus. I was always interested and wanted to know more since he seemed to have such a positive influence on people. In March of 2012, I decided to listen to my emotions and attend church. This was a turning point in my life. My ex-wife and I were attending regularly and were baptized. In 2014, my mother passed away of cancer and my marriage ended abruptly in 2018. It was at that point I started to lose my faith. As time passed and without the feeling of God in my life, I remarried and now have a beautiful wife and stepdaughter. As parts of my life repaired, I started to feel the same way I did back in 2012 about God and missing the presence in my life. My wife, daughter, and I started attending Stafford Crossing and I knew this was our home. Next step, baptism by submersion. So here I am, standing here today, knowing that Jesus is my Savior, and I owe my life to him. Ted, thanks for sharing your story and uh, the story of God's work in you, right? So uh, based on your testimony and your faith in Jesus and Jesus alone, uh, it's a privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our next baptism is Dominic Francis. I chose to accept Jesus one day last spring. Mom and I were talking about if Jesus was to come back right now, would kids be taken up to heaven? Eventually, we started talking about me, and then Mom asked, do you believe in Jesus? And that's when I accepted Jesus into my heart. That means that I'm letting Jesus make my decision that he took my sin away. One difference that this has made is that Jesus has led me to know that I get angry a lot, and I've been working on that, and that's how I chose to be a Christian. 
That was great, Dominic. Uh, you know, God's got a lot of things in store for you and things he's going to be working on and transforming you, because right? we live for life change, right, as we follow Jesus. Well, based on your testimony, because your faith in Jesus and, uh, and trust in him, it's a privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our next baptism will be Miss Cynthia Gallant. I was blessed to grow up in a Christian home. When I was about nine, I asked God to come into my heart, and instantly I felt the Holy Spirit. Through the years after that, I grew in my understanding of what Jesus had done for me on the cross. Jesus has always been with me through every step of my life, the good and the bad. He has never left me. He is my constant friend and savior. I will always continue to grow in my relationship with Jesus. Cynthia, it's a beautiful picture. So Dominic just went, and, uh, and just a picture of how God works in us in different ways and different times. And uh, it's a privilege uh, hearing your testimony and based on your faith in Jesus to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our next baptism is Adam Welch. Having grown up in a Christian household, God has been a part of my life since birth. When I was young, I made the decision to accept Christ into my heart, although my intentions were less than sincere. I spent the large part of my childhood terrified of dying, and after learning about heaven and hell, I was terrified of what would happen to me if I died without knowing Christ as my Savior. When I was 13, my family and I were involved in a car accident that should have taken our lives. But through God's grace, we all walked away unscathed. Over the next few months, I reflected on how I had cheapened an amazing relationship with my Creator by reducing God's gift of salvation to something like that of a death insurance policy. I knew that I needed to change how I viewed God's love and my relationship with Him, and I rededicated my life to Christ. Since accepting Christ, my faith has grown and been tested in a variety of ways. I can wholeheartedly say, that I have a better understanding of how great God's love is for me, and I find myself dumbstruck by how much the creator of the universe cares for me. It's been a humbling but wonderful experience getting to seek God over my years, and I hope to reflect his love to others in how I live out my life. Amen. Thank you for sharing that with us, Adam. And, uh, you know, your story is a great picture of just responding to God in different ways and how he leads us step by step. And, uh, and, you know, recommitting and putting your trust in Jesus. So based on your faith in him, it's a privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Jacob, Jacob Halstead, come on up. Sunday. For the first four years of my life, I went to the First Baptist Church of Delaware with my parents most of the time. And we stopped going because we had to move from my dad's work. I grew up believing that I was saved, but at summer camp in Tennessee, I realized I'd been lying to myself. Then the pastor at the summer camp asked who wanted to be with Christ. He told us not to close our eyes and that if you wanted to come be with Christ, to stand up. It was a touching day that changed my life, and I could thank my parents, but most of all, Mr. David Jackson. He truly would just sit down and talk with me about life and how everything was for me. I saw God work through him to lead me to a relationship with Christ, and I'm very grateful to him. What a great picture of that shepherding that happens. You know, for you, it was David Jackson, um, and, and, uh, and I know he's excited to see this happen and take, take place. But Jacob, based on your testimony and your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, it's a pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The next baptism will be Miss Allie Evans. Woo! 
I have been attending church and hearing about Jesus my whole life. I always enjoyed the stories and lessons I learned in junior church, but only recently I began to understand what it all means and how much God is working in my life. I have sensory processing disorder, and sometimes I struggle and have to work harder to accomplish my goals and to get where I'd like to be. Through these struggles, I turn to God and I pray, and he really does help me through it. I have seen the blessings in my parents' lives, and I knew I wanted to accept Jesus in my heart, too. I am so thankful for all that he has done for me and then all that he will continue to do for me. John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's great. You know, Allie, one of the things that brings us to God most often is our struggles. And you're realizing that. I'm, I'm thrilled that you've, you're learning this at such a young age and turn into God in that struggle. So based on your testimony, it's a privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Our next baptism will be Miss Peg York. I knew about God and Jesus as a child. I remember listening to Bible stories early in my life, and I knew that Christmas and Easter were more than Santa Claus and Easter bunnies. We as a family faced several crises which had us questioning why these things were happening. This is when I learned to pray to Jesus and ask him for help. I am talking about mom becoming blind for three days, dad being burned on his left side of his body, our farmhouse filling with four and a half feet of flood water with all of us wondering if we would make it to higher ground, and dad getting polo just after we all had gotten vaccinated. Our prayers were answered because we all survived. In high school, I took more, a more serious interest in church, attending the teen activities and singing in the choir. I wanted to learn more about Jesus because he seemed almost too good to be real. Could I really trust him all the time? The first year of marriage continued to challenge my faith. I had a very challenging class of 19 sixth graders, and then my father was hospitalized for two months with heart problems. On three separate days, I got calls at school that he was having an emergency surgery, so I rushed to the hospital, which was an hour away. I got another call at school in March. My husband was in the hospital in Milwaukee with pneumonia. This time, I had to drive from Iowa to Wisconsin, praying to Jesus all the way there. That's when I began to trust Jesus all the time, not just in crisis. It is faith in Jesus that has guided me since then. I try to look at the cup half full and to thank him every day. I continue to call on his guidance in coping with Parkinson's and exploring new ways I can help others deal with Parkinson's. Peg, that's a beautiful story of God just meeting you and the crises and, and showing himself, revealing himself through that. And uh, it's a privilege, based on your testimony and your faith in Jesus, to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our next baptism is Peg's husband, Jim York. My spiritual life, like my personal life, has involved a lot of wandering from place to place. Quite literally, I've lived in over 20 different locations. I've held more than 20 jobs, and I drove a truck more than 1 million miles over the roads of the United States and Canada, wandering from place to place. My spiritual life wandering started with Sunday school, preparing for membership in the Presbyterian Church, where I was often embarrassed when my father was the last and loudest person in the congregation to say amen at the end of each prayer. <laughs> Later on, my wandering included the Catholic Church, where I became a member to support my wife and our daughter in, our, in her formative years. This wandering might be described with a recent phrase from Pastor Dave as, anywhere but here. 
All that changed when a good friend and Stafford Crossing member told me about this church. My wife and I began attending services last year. I immediately realized that this community was different. The scriptures and sermons spoke directly to my heart. Each message helped me to realize and acknowledge my many sins and flaws. I finally understand that this spiritual wandering had left a sense of emptiness and resulted in many poor life decisions. One Sunday I asked, what are the next steps to become a member of this church? We were directed to the next steps class. There I realized I had not fully put my trust in Jesus Christ. With the help of Pastor Dave and several great references, I am happy to tell you that I've made that decision. I now feel a spiritual connection with God. I'm eager to recognize and make the changes needed to be a better disciple, husband, and community member. Jim, uh, some of our conversations have been, uh, I, I really enjoyed them, and uh, it's been great getting just speaking with you, but uh, I loved hearing your story and, and how God meets the wanderer, right, and, and brought your path back around to him. Uh, so praise God for that. And it's a privilege based on this testimony, based on your faith in Jesus and Jesus alone, to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, it is appropriate to uh, end this service in just a little bit of a song about holy water and how we know that, you know, waters of baptism are not magical. It's, it's the power of Jesus and God at work in us. And uh, so let's stand, let's celebrate and, uh, and worship him. Come on. Got him on my knees again. Got him begging, please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Sing it out. Walking down these desert roads. Water for my thirsty soul, I need you, oh, I need you, and your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips, and like the sound of a symphony to my ears, and like holy water on my skin we're gonna send you all out at that point you have a great day this week have a great one we'll see you next week there'll be folks at the door to take your ties and offerings and folks down front dead man walking slave to sin i want to know about being born again i need you oh god i need you so take me to the riverside, take me under baptized, I need you, oh God, I need you.